morning, guys. We're going to start with prayer because the computer's not working, and apparently the sound isn't working with my other mic. So, but that's not going to stop the word of God Amen. from finding a home in your hearts. I trust. Amen. So pray with me. Heavenly Father, you know all things, and we know that nothing escapes your notice. And nothing the devil can do is without your knowledge and your permission. That's right. And so, Lord, we accept this from your hand and pray that you would use this to draw us to you, that you would draw us into relationship. Lord, you know our hearts. You know that without you, morally so, and spiritually, we are completely paralyzed. And we can do no good thing. Either our motives are corrupt or we're just completely selfish. And yet, Lord, you come into our lives and you make us new. Lord, I pray that you would breathe new life into this passage today, that you might use the tools here to make a difference in our lives, that you would be glorified. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 We're in the book of Luke, we're in chapter 5. We're going to pick it up about halfway through. If you remember last week, Jesus was pinned up against the lake of the Gennesaret. And when he was there, everyone found him. He was, he was doing his morning devotions, and they kind of cornered him and said, where you, where, where you been? Where are you going? And uh, they just... He jumped in a boat. It just so happened to be Peter's, but they were mending their net. And so he tells Peter, hey... Let's just put out a little bit here. These people are crowding me into the water. So he goes out and he shares a sermon with them. And, of course, he has Peter as a captive audience. <laughs> kind of slick. I think that's why he kept him close. Because he was a danger to everyone, including himself. <laughs> and then he tells Peter, let's put out a little further and catch some fish. Peter, I'm sure, rolled his eyes and said, well, Lord, we've been fishing all night and caught nothing but because of your word, I'll put out a net. He puts out one. He humors Jesus. He's a rabbi. What's he know about fishing? <laughs> and so he throws out a net, and he has so many fish that they, the nets begin to break. The nets that they've cared for and tried to keep clean and worked so hard on have now had to be dirtied by going in the water, and uh, I'm sure until the fish came, that's exactly what Peter was thinking. And they have so many fish, they can't contain them all, so they have to call some friends over to help them with it. So as they do that, they come over, and there's so many fish, they start pulling it up into the boat, and both the boats begin to sink. And Peter drops to his knees, and he sees the Lord, and he says, Lord, leave me. I'm a man who is, uh, I'm wicked. And you, you don't, I'm the wrong guy. You don't want to be with me. And I see Jesus smiling over him and saying, from now on, you're going to catch men. Amen. And he calls Peter, and Peter and his brother and James and John, they leave their nets and they follow Jesus from that point on into full-time ministry, uh, leaving the fish, leaving their father, Zebedee, to handle whatever had to be done in the mending of that net. And so we see Jesus doing this miracle of fish. The next thing it, it is that we see in chapter 5 is he runs into a leper. And it's a leper that Luke, who is a doctor, tells us he's full of leprosy. Every piece of his body has been infected. Probably a nose missing, probably digits missing. Um, scarred, and he would have to cry out to people, unclean, unclean, according to the law, so that people would know that a leper was coming his way. And he comes to Jesus and falls down, and he says, Lord, if you're willing, you can make me clean. What a great statement of faith. And Jesus says, I'm willing. He touches him, and he says, be cleansed, and he is. Then he gets him up, and he says, listen, don't, don't tell anybody, which has got to be a hard thing, but rather go to show yourself to the priests and do the, with that which is required by the law of Moses. In chapter 14 of Deuteronomy, it gives this whole long thing of what a leper's to do once they're cleansed, but no one's ever done it because nobody's ever been cleansed of leprosy. And God put that in the scripture just for this event so he might be a witness to the chief priest, to Annas and Caiaphas. I just think that's so cool 
God puts an impossible thing in there, and you go, there's nobody going to be cleansed of leprosy, and yet there are. And it's to show that Jesus is the Messiah, who he said he is. So we went over that last week, and there's so much more. But Jesus, we're going to pick up where Jesus is, and he's presumably still in Peter's house in Capernaum along the water. And he says, now it happened on a certain day as he was teaching that there were Pharisees and teachers of the law sitting by who had come out every town of Galilee, Judea, and Jerusalem. So Jesus is having a Bible study, and he has some of the more preeminent teachers sitting in the house listening to him. This is before they actually hated his guts and tried to kill him. They were curious. There are miracles happening, and they want to know what's going on. And some of them have come as far as Jerusalem, some of the premier teachers, to sit at a Bible study with Jesus in Peter's house. And so they're all sitting there, and so he's got this religious elite all around him. And the power of the Lord was present to heal them. The interesting thing is, it says that the power of the Lord was with him to heal them. The antecedent in the passage is the religious rulers. The power of Jesus was there to heal them. And yet you read the rest of the story and he heals a paralytic and you think that was the power that was with him to heal him, but it was to heal them. Religious people are sometimes the most difficult people because they think they're okay. I've got it together, I got my golden ticket. And then you shut off to learning and you don't think anybody else has anything to tell you. And then behold, men brought a man on a bed a man who was paralyzed, whom they sought to bring in and lay before him, meaning Jesus. And when they could not find how they might bring him in because of the crowd, they went up to the housetop and they let him down with his bed through the tiling in the midst before Jesus. You have four men, one in every corner of a blanket, I imagine, and they're trying to get this paralyzed guy to Jesus because they're absolutely sure that Jesus can heal him. So they get to the house, and there are crowds around the house. You couldn't get up to the window. You couldn't get up to the door. People were pressing in like a concert. They wanted to see the attraction. And they couldn't get him in. And so these men, they've got a team, and they develop a tactic. Because what they need to do is they need to get him in front of Jesus. So what they do is they climb up on the roof. And these are, these are shingles, not like we have in the Northeast because snow and ice will destroy this roof. It's a, a corrugated brick roof, if you will. And they start pulling the roof apart. How would you like to have a Bible study at your house and somebody start tearing on your roof? <laughs> Tear, tearing apart the all of the shingles up on the roof and making a hole. And can you imagine Jesus and all the premier religious elite there and suddenly there's dust coming from the ceiling. And then pretty soon there are chunks coming from the ceiling and there are people moving out of the way and then there's daylight. And then the daylight gets bigger and bigger and bigger and then you see faces. And then all of a sudden, here's this paralyzed guy coming right in the middle of the Bible study. You could see it happening here, right? Wouldn't that be something? You guys would move, I'm sure. You know, be... But they need to get him in front of Jesus, and they put him right in the middle of the room. Can't, can't be avoided now. And when he saw their faith, it amazes me that Jesus sees this, and what he sees is the faith of four men lowering their friend in front of Jesus. What would you do to bring somebody to Jesus? I mean, we're always so afraid of rejection. and These guys were motivated, and they believed that Jesus would help. And it's because they loved him. And when he saw their faith, it's interesting, I'll bet Peter saw the uh, repair bill. The religious ruler probably saw rude people. How rude. Having a Bible study. The teacher's teaching. Never seen anything like this in my synagogue. 
And yet Peter, uh, not Peter, I'm sorry, Jesus looks and he sees their faith. Amen. Some people see a paralyzed man. They see a man who's in sin probably and God is punishing him with this state or maybe his parents' sin, of course, which was a common belief. Mm -hmm. Jesus saw their faith. And he said to him, man, your sins are forgiven you. It's interesting, see, he knew exactly what his friends wanted. His friends wanted him healed physically. Jesus knew his greatest need. And he said, your sins are forgiven. And you know, that's the first thing Jesus takes care of with you and I. Very often we wait until something of catastrophe uh, dimensions comes into our lives and then we pray. But you know, the greatest thing that we have is our sins to be forgiven because it affects everything that we do and everyone that we talk, talk to, our every word and our every attitude and action. And the scribes and the Pharisees began to reason saying, who is this who speaks blasphemies? Who can forgive sin but God alone? Well, you know they're right. Because anytime we sin, we sin against God. He's the one who set up right and wrong. In fact, he is right. And everything else that is not him is wrong. And when we sin, we sin against a holy God more than we sin against any other person. In fact, David cries out and he says, against you and you only have I sinned. And we understand that it's because our sin against God is so big that our sin against other people who are fellow sinners is a much smaller matter. Not that it should be avoided and we shouldn't deal with it, but we need to take care of our, stu our stuff with God. So they begin to murmur in their minds, who can do this but God? That's the point. Jesus is letting them know who he is. He is the Son of God, God the Son, right in their midst. Now remember, they were within themselves reasoning. But when Jesus perceived their thoughts, did you know Jesus perceives your thoughts? Sometimes in the middle of a thought, I'll remember that. Oh. I'm sorry, Lord. He answered and said to them, why are you reasoning in your hearts? Which is easier to say, your sins are forgiven you, or to say, rise up and walk? Well, it's pretty easy to speak. You know, since I was five, I could speak. But which is easier to say, your sins are forgiven, which if you tell somebody your sins are forgiven, what happens? Nothing. Nothing. If you tell somebody, take up your bed and walk, what happens? It's pretty obvious. The power of God has come into this man's life for him to walk. And so Jesus tells him his sins are forgiven, and he does it on purpose. He's sticking his finger in the face of these people. Your sins are forgiven you, or say, rise up and walk. But that you may know that the Son of Man has power on earth to forgive sins. That's why he said it, because he was teaching. Everything Jesus did was teaching. He said to the man who was paralyzed, I say to you, arise, take up your bed, and go to your house. This is in the middle of a Bible study, and I'm sure it was just as quiet as it is here. Immediately, he rose up before them, took up what he had been lying on, and he departed, he went to his own house, glorifying God. Can you see this guy who's been paralyzed who gets up and Jesus makes eye contact with and he says, get up, take your stuff, go home. There's nothing to see here. And he gets up. Can you imagine the guys on the roof? The fulfillment that they must have had that they brought somebody to Jesus and Jesus healed them. Amen. Can you imagine the crowd who prevented them from him getting in? Now he has to push his way out. And I imagine he's singing, everlasting, you know. He's going out singing. He's healed. And greater than that, he's forgiven of his sins. And by the way, that's the order that God does that in our lives too. He'll forgive us of our sins first, and then he'll rebuild our lives and cause us to walk. 
And they were all amazed. And they glorified God, and they were filled with fear, saying, we have seen strange things today. That's hardly a compliment. That was pretty whacked. We have seen strange things today. So Jesus makes a statement of who he is. After these things, he went out and he saw a tax collector. I don't know if any of you know someone from the IRS. But he saw a tax collector named Levi. Now, we know that Jesus calls him Matthew. But we can, get, we can get from his name that he's part of the tribe of Levi and that he very well could have been a priest. Except he decided that he would serve Rome and fill his pockets. These were the most despised people in society. These were folks that, uh, I mean, even more than, than shepherds. Shepherds were just dirty and unschooled. But these people defiantly turned in their own people. And they had to bid for this position, by the way. So they would bid against other people, and the highest bidder, the Romans, say, yeah, we want you. And then what they would do is they'd have a quota. They'd have to collect a certain quota of finances from the people of that region, and anything extra was theirs. It's kind of like selling cars. I'm sorry. I used to sell cars. And what you try to do is get full sticker price because you get the bigger commission that way. Anyway, things have changed since I was young. But anyway, here's Levi sitting at his table collecting money, doing his job, and Jesus walks up and he says to him, follow me. It's interesting here in the book of Luke, it says, he went out and saw a tax collector. If you look at Matthew's account in chapter 9 of Matthew, it says, Jesus saw a man. He didn't see a tax collector. He saw a man. And from Matthew's point of view, that was it. I'm sure Jesus made eye contact with him, and Jesus saw a man. He saw behind the things that he was, the things that he was doing, and he said, follow me. Jesus still does this today to every one of us. And he looks through everything we've ever done with perfect grace, and he says, follow me. And so he left all, and he rose up and followed him. Matthew left everything. And I'm sure it wasn't a problem for the Romans to just find somebody else that looked just like him and put him in place. But he had, he had left everything. I'm not sure that Peter and John, I mean, they had, to, they had to leave everything. Peter and Andrew and James and John, they had to leave their fish. They had to leave everything. But Matthew is leaving a thriving business where he might become extremely wealthy. In fact, he being one of the 12 disciples was probably the most wealthy of all the disciples because of his background. So he left all, he rose up, and he followed him. And then Levi gave him a great feast in his own house. We read these things and don't think about what that's like. Jesus says, follow me. He leaves everything, and he says, come on, let's have a barbecue. And Jesus is traveling with a bunch of disciples, a bunch of disciples, not just 12. And they all, the whole crowd of them, go over to his house, and I'm sure he's got a beautiful house. And he brings them into his own house. You know, there's, there's something about people welcoming you into their home that's very intimate. And whenever you have people in your house, they ruin stuff. You know, you know what I'm talking about? Hey, come on in. And, you know, they come in with mud on their shoes, and you can tell everywhere they've been, and you know, it's just a fact. That's why we don't have anyone over our house. <laughs> but they break things. They use stuff, you know. So Levi gave a great feast in his own house. All of these fishermen, 
all of these common folk. And there was a great number of tax collectors and others who sat down with them. See, Matthew invited all of his friends from the tax collecting business, all of the other scum of Israel who were lining their pockets with the Hebrew money and working for the Romans. And he asks them all to come. How cool. So here's Jesus sitting in a room full of rich sharks, literally swimming with the sharks. And the scribes and the Pharisees complained against the disciples. Notice who they complained against. It wasn't Jesus. <laughs> Jesus was the one sitting in the room with all of them. And instead, they don't go tell Jesus about it. They go find one of his disciples and say, what are you doing? And complained against the disciples saying, why do you drink and eat with tax collectors and sinners? I don't know, I was hungry, I was thirsty. Why do, you, why do you associate? You see, I don't know if you know this, but in Israel, when you would eat with somebody, they would get bowls of stuff that looks like you don't know what. And all the bowls would be put on the table, and then what you do is you get some flat pita bread, and everybody's dipping in the bowl and eating, and that's pretty much how you eat. That's communal eating. And there's no double dipping rules or anything. <laughs> and so you become one with everyone. You're sharing bits of food with everyone and you're made of the same stuff that they are and you're swapping spit in a bowl and you're, you're all one, you see? That's why communion is such a, a sacred thing. You become one with those people. And so they're all sharing food together, and they're like, why is Jesus? Now, oh, my poor slides. You can see, you can see that the room is full of the rich elite, and the Pharisees are outside criticizing. And instead of bringing it to Jesus directly, they bring it to his disciples and say, why, why are you eating with tax collectors and sinners? And I love the fact that Jesus catches that and he gets involved in the conversation at that point. You know, believers take a lot of flack for serving Jesus and doing the things that Jesus tells them to do. And instead of people telling the Lord about it, they'll, they'll, they'll rag on you about it. I can't believe that. So the Pharisees are on the outside. Now, these guys felt they should have been near Jesus like they were at the Bible study just previously. They should have been center stage. They should have been front row. But instead, Jesus goes over this guy's house, and the Pharisees are out in the curb. And that's really why they're upset. But he says, why do you eat with tax collectors and sinners? You know, Jesus wants us to associate with sinners. He doesn't want you to do what they do. He wants them to do what you do. And hopefully your faith is strong enough that whatever it is they're doing doesn't get on you, but what you're doing gets on them. So Jesus answered and said to them, those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. It is so easy to preach to a believer until you're preaching to a non-believer. And then everything changes. And then the whole weird dynamic takes over. Jesus said, I have come as a doctor to those who are spiritually sick. I haven't to come to call the righteous. Why do you have to call the righteous? It's like leaving 99 sheep in the wilderness. It's all right, they'll be okay. But sinners to repentance. Never forget that Jesus stoops lower than you and I would. And then they said to him, 
Well, why do the disciples of John fast often and make prayers? And likewise, those of the Pharisees, but yours eat and drink. You know, some people think that a life with Jesus Christ is all about being austere and serious. And sad. Right? It, that's not what life in Jesus is. Life in Jesus is joy and peace. He says, I have come that they may have life and life to the full. That's what life in Jesus is because my sins are forgiven and I know I'm good with God because Jesus took my punishment away on the cross. I'm free. And it doesn't matter how many eyes peer at me and tell me that I'm not doing things the right way. I can't believe that you said those funny things in church. I love you. You act like you're just talking to somebody. I could do that. Well, yeah, you could. You use the voice in church? Yeah, I do that too. <laughs> so what? Listen, we're free in Jesus Christ. We are free in a way that you don't even know, in a way that's not even right. We should suffer for the things we've done. But Jesus took it all for us. So why is it that you eat and drink? Why is it you're not fasting? And why isn't your face all messed up? And why aren't you, you know, a monk up on a hill meditating on your navel or something? Why, what's wrong with you? <laughs> and that's what people think the Christian life is about. It's about sorrow. It's about suffering. It's about misery. I mean, it's, well, you know, you have to die to yourself and take up your cross and follow him. You know what Jesus said? He says, what will I liken this generation unto? He says, John the Baptist came not eating and not drinking, because he hadn't touched wine, by the way. He was not an alcohol drinker. And he didn't eat. He ate locusts. You know, locusts. And they criticized him. Too strong. And Jesus came eating and drinking, and they call him a glutton and a drunk. It's like, you, you know, when people want to be critical, there's nothing good you can do. There's no right thing that you can do. Even if you do everything they do, they will criticize you. So you know what? Do what Jesus does. Jesus sat with sinners. He ate and drank with sinners in the hopes that he might rescue some. Peter says, I've become all things to all men that by which I may win some to Christ. That is the mission that Jesus gives us. Or why not just take me home? What does he need me for? If I'm not going to share the good news with believers and unbelievers as well, why am I here? This is why slides are good. They keep me on track. <laughs> why is it that your disciples are free to eat and drink and you associate with sinners? And he said to them, can you make the friends of the bridegroom fast while the bridegroom is with them? But the days will come when the bridegroom will be taken away from them, and then they will fast in those days. You see, Jesus says, I'm here. Why should they be in misery? This is like a wedding feast. You don't see anybody fasting at a wedding feast, do you? Hey, let's go get some food. No, no. I can't enter into this joyous occasion. I don't touch carbs or sugar or protein or really anything because I'm fasting. And Jesus said, when you fast, which assumes that you will, when you fast, don't disfigure your face like men do because they want the approval of men. Certainly they have their reward. But when you fast, do it in secret. You know, comb your hair, look good, smell good. And, and, and get off that whole sad rock you're sitting on. And do it for God if you're going to do it. Don't do it to be seen to people as a show-off, like I'm a super spiritual person. <laughs> Let it go. People know you're a schmuck. It's just the way it is. <laughs> just like me. He says, listen, this is like being at a wedding feast and fasting, guys. Come on, get over it. And then he spoke this parable to them. He says, no one puts a piece of new garment on an old one. Otherwise, the new makes a tear, and also the piece that was, it was taken out of, of the new, it does not match the old. So he's going to bring up a sewing application. You don't take a new patch and put it on an old piece of clothing. 
First of all, where do you get that new patch? From a new piece of clothing. Why would you cut something off of a new piece of clothing to put it on an old piece of clothing? Well, dude, I've had this since I was 12 years old. I really like it. Yeah, okay, I can see that. <laughs> but see, what happens is because you have a new piece, the new piece cer certainly doesn't match, and then when it goes on, you, c you sew this thing on, and it was like a big thing in hippie days. You know, you had more patch than pants. And, you know, you, and, and I had some brilliant, brilliant slides, but you, you sew these patches on, and the problem is you wash it and dry it one time, and it goes like this. <laughs> And it tears at the old piece because it's, a, it's old clothing and the fibers are worn and weak and it won't hold the shrink of the new one. He says, you don't take a new patch and put it on an old piece of clothing. They don't match for number one. And my wife, would, uh, my wife hates anything that doesn't match. <laughs> That's why I have blues and grays all tied together, including my shoes. He says, first of all, it doesn't match. Second of all, it's going to tear, and, and it's going to be worse than in the beginning. So you're going to have a bigger hole than what you started with. Okay, thanks, Jesus, for the sewing class. He's saying, I have come to bring grace, and you can't hold on to the law and have grace. Either you're going to have grace or the law. It's like raising children. You can raise them to be obedient or you can raise them to have a relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. Being obedient is only going to happen when your eye is upon them, and maybe not even then. But a relationship with Jesus Christ, the Lord makes them a new creature in Christ Jesus. The old things are gone. Behold, all things are new. You don't just take Jesus and add him as an ingredient to your life because you're not going to be able to do that. Either he is your life or he's not your life. He can't be a patch. He can't just be, oh, yeah, I'm a Christian. Well, I do all these other things, too. Well, how would Jesus feel about that? Well, it really doesn't matter because he's not here, so, you know. And there are people that are like that. He's all or nothing. And no one puts new wine into old wineskins. So he, he had a sewing application. Now he's going to use wine because they might know more about that. And no one puts new wine into old wineskins or else the new wine will burst the wineskins and be spilled and the wineskins will be ruined. But new wine must be put into new wineskins so that both are preserved. A wineskin is made out of leather which is an animal. And I don't know about you, but I've seen all kinds of wineskins, and usually the ones, you know, the cool ones you can put like over and you can kind of carry with you, and, you know, you can squirt from this far away. I had one when I was young, but I didn't have any wine for it. But they're usually made out of rubber bladder on the inside so that they don't have the problem. But if you take new wine, you take grape juice off of grapes and you put it in these things because they didn't put it in wood casks like you might understand. They put it in a skin and they would tie up like where the head got cut off and the tail and all that stuff, and they would, it would be full of wine. Being that it's a fresh new skin, it expands as the bacteria begins to eat the sugar and as the alcohol and the fumes are getting pushed off, it actually expands and everything is fine. Today what they do with, with uh, kegs is they put a vent on it so that it's allowed to vent. So as all of that maturation of the wine is happening, it's able to let off some air. But back then, they put them in skins, and they would have to mature inside those skins, and over the years that they would be waiting, it would just get bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger like a balloon. But it was okay because it was a new skin. But after it becomes alcohol, it begins to dry out the skin, and the leather becomes not flexible. And so if you're real cheap, you try to use that a second time. You know, you empty it out and you, you, you know, you've run out of wine. Now what you do is you try to put new wine back in that skin. And what happens is the skin can't handle the expansion. And of course you want to keep it closed so bugs don't get in. And, and what happens is it breaks the skin because it's dry and old and you shouldn't do that. And Jesus says, you don't put new wine in old wine skins you know what? Some of us are old wineskins. The Pharisees he was talking to are old wineskins. 
These guys had no flexibility. They had no expansion. There was no way that they had room for grace in their heart because God hadn't done a work in their heart. They were trying to fit all of this in like a patch on a piece of old clothing, like new wine in an old wineskin. They didn't get it. That's one of the signs that they didn't have a spiritual life and a relationship. It's kind of what happens when someone who's used to very liturgical, old-school church, and they come here, and they go, dude, you got drums, a guitar? What have I gotten myself into? They're a bit of an old wineskin. And what happens is they, they hear the worship, and they're, like, astonished, like, oh, my goodness, they're contemporary music and drums. What it's going to do is it's going to ruin the wine and the wineskin. So, take new wine and put it in a new wineskin. No one, having drunk old wine, immediately desires new, for he says, the old is better. The old is better. You know, we all, and some of us more than others, have a tendency to do what we know. How many of you are risk takers? Few. How many of you enjoy the comfort of the familiar? Yes. Everyone embraces the idea of change, but nobody wants to change. That's why diets don't work. That's why people have things in their life that they need to get rid of, that they keep doing bad habits, but they keep doing them. Why? Because there's this familiar comfort with something that we know. And the thing that we don't know, we're not comfortable with. And so, like, how about going to a restaurant you've never been to and spending money on something you don't know what you're going to get? Not, there aren't a lot of people that would do that, unless they were being paid and they were a food critic. We do the things we're comfortable with. We have favorite restaurants. We have favorite people we spend time with. You even have a favorite chair you sit in. God forbid a guest comes in here and sits in your chair. You're going to give them a look. I know you will. You'd be like, and you'll be looking around like, where, where do I sit? I don't even know what to do. I can't even concentrate on worship. Old wine skin. Spurgeon said, you should change everything about your service on a regular basis. Move the chairs, change the presentation, shuffle the order. He says, you should do all that because people get stuck in this dead liturgy. They become lethargic in the liturgy. And so I will disrupt all of you, and I don't even feel bad about it. Jesus does two things in this section of chapter 5. Number one, he heals a man who's paralyzed. If you have a life where you are paralyzed, where there are things that you can't do and there's no mobility and you don't have the ability to move on to the next thing, Jesus can heal you. If you have a life that you've been practicing and you don't like your life, like Matthew, Jesus says, follow me. And he will take us. And he looks through the things that we've done and he sees the person. And he loves people and he hates sin. The problem with us is we tend to hate people and love sin. But God is good. God is good. I'm going to ask the worship team to come up. That concludes chapter 5. Next week, we're going to see how Jesus handles Sabbath day rules.